strongest, he's the quickest, he's the best. Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon. A hazelnut in every bite. In our previous episode, we discussed Belle and Sebastian, an animated show from Japan with a series-long adventure story and tight continuity. While this wasn't an odd thing for Japanese animation, in America in the early 80s, it was almost unheard of. Animated shows in the United States were almost all episodic works, each episode being a self-contained story, and the vast majority of them were comedies. This was changing with the rise of action-heavy toyetic cartoons, and eventually continuity would be seen as an added virtue to children's media. But even then, there was still a significant comedic element in these shows, to widen the appeal and put parents at ease. This isn't a value judgment. I love me a classic episode of Scooby-Doo, but trends in Japanese animation and trends in American animation were pretty stark, and if you wanted narrative strong animation, you had to import what Japan was making. And please do that. Bringing different kinds of stories to children can help expand their creative horizons. But when you're introducing animation to your children's cable channel, having a show with similar values to what children are already watching can offer a sense of familiarity and comfort, even if it's from a show they've never seen before. But it can't just be any old Saturday morning affair. Jerry Laybourne and the post Schneider Nickelodeon was still going to have standards. We have found that there are lots of kids' programs out there, but not that many are really fabulous. We've had to go to the international marketplace to find programs such as Danger Mouse. Um, are we going anywhere in particular, Chief? America, Benfo. That's where the last building disappeared from. Oh! Danger Mouse is the world's greatest secret agent. Physically talented, mentally sharp, Danger Mouse is summoned by his superior, Colonel K, whenever the villainous frog, Baron Silas Greenback, is up to his world-conquering schemes. Be it drowning the planet in custard, controlling an army of sentient washing machines, or using a growth formula to create a Godzilla-sized chicken. Joining Danger Mouse is his friend and flatmate, Penfold, who is both incredibly cowardly and blissfully stupid. Chief, why are you wearing a frock? I am not wearing a... Get this clown off me! The adventures of Danger Mouse and Penfold see them traveling all across the globe, from the frozen North Pole to the sweltering deserts of Egypt, and into space to alien planets and alternate dimensions. One day, they're shrinking to microscopic sizes to chase Greenback into Colonel K's body. The next, they're traveling through time to meet the dinosaurs. It's never a dull day for Danger Mouse. Resting between cases, our hero is swatting up on prehistoric trigonometry while Penfold, his faithful assistant, attempts to calculate how many dirty shirts he can get into the washer. Produced by Crossgrove Hall Films and Thames Television, Danger Mouse originally premiered on ITV in September of 1981. When Nickelodeon picked it up in the summer of 84, the show had just wrapped up its fifth season. Nickelodeon, the channel that gave you Against the Mice, Kids Mice, The Third Mice, now brings you the greatest mouse adventure of them all, Danger Mouse. With his trusted companion Penfold, the mouse is ever ready to battle the revolting Baron Greenback and his evil schemes to rule the world. Danger Mouse. You can catch him beginning in June. Watch for him right after Mice Can't Do That on television. Altogether, Danger Mouse would run for 10 series between 1981 and 1992, for a total of 161 episodes. But there really should be a big asterisk on those numbers, because what counts as an episode or even a series gets pretty wonky the closer you look at it. The format of Danger Mouse changed dramatically over that decade. Sometimes episodes would be 22 minutes, sometimes they'd be 10 minutes, and sometimes they'd be 5 minutes. 
A significant chunk of Danger Mouse is serialized stories made up of five five-minute parts, complete with recaps and cliffhangers. Will there be a cavity where DM lost to the force of gravity? Will there be a dent where he went? To find out, tune in to the next installing enthrallment of Danger Mouse, public enemy number one. Each five-minute part counted as an episode. Altogether, 90 of the show's 161 episodes are five-minuters, which only represent 18 stories. And really, after the opening theme, the recap from the previous episode, the cliffhanger, and the end credits, you're only really getting about three minutes of Danger Mouse per episode. It was kind of frustrating sitting through all of that during my marathon watches for this project, but people I've talked to who were contemporary viewers of the show, who watched one five-minute episode a day after school, they said they were frustrated with how little of Danger Mouse they were getting in this format. The format was dropped after Series 4 in 1983, and subsequent re-airings and airings on foreign markets usually edited them into single episodes. But after removing the extra opening themes, and the credits, and the recaps, and the cliffhangers, that usually left the episode about 19 minutes long. When you're trying to stick to the usual half-hour television format, that can be a bit tricky. But filling those empty minutes are going to be a problem for Nickelodeon 1985. All told, there was roughly 23 and a half hours of Danger Mouse in total, which is still a decent chunk of television. Not spread out evenly, of course. Series 4 in 1983 had 45 five-minute episodes. Series 8 in 1987 had two 10-minute episodes. Some Danger Mouse series are so short that some episode guides condense them into others. Good grief. While there is plenty of action sequences, Danger Mouse is first and foremost a comedy, and it uses a kitchen sink approach to getting a laugh. Sight gags, wordplay. Penfo, throw me a towel, will you? Ooh, what a funny, ooh, still. Ah, ooh, ooh. I said throw me a towel, not a trowel. Visual absurdity. Adam West Batman style fighting words, goofy cartoon violence, satire, and two scoops of fourth wall breaking meta humor, especially in relation to the narrator, who is an actual character whose seemingly godlike powers can affect the story. The biggest example being in the series 6 story, Once Upon a Time Slip, where the narrator tries to say that the time is 12.15 in the afternoon, but the microphone picks it up wrong, and Danger Mouse and Penfold find themselves in the year 12.15. I don't know. <laughs> Might make a change from all this space age zap powy secret agent stuff. <laughs> the announcer's voice is controlling the picture, dictating what we do. Ah, and um, what are we gonna do? I don't know, have a dafter adventure than usual, I suppose. Crumbs! The show finds itself pretty malleable to whatever wacky things the writers came up with at this time. The emphasis more of the humor than on the story and the characters. The character of Danger Mouse himself varies wildly from episode to episode, changing to fit whatever the gags need him to be. Sometimes he's hyper-competent, and the humor comes from him devising a weird but effective solution from his list of esoteric interests. Do you know why I never became an opera singer, Pempo? No, and at the moment I'm not really bothered, dear. No, no, seriously. You know how some singers can break glass with high notes? Yes. Well, I used to break up the theatres. Hey, that's great! Yes, the theatre owners didn't think so, though. Other times, Danger Mouse is clumsy and buffoonish, getting on the receiving end of Looney Tunes-style violence that frames him more of a Daffy Duck or Wily Coyote-type character. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Danger Mouse is whatever the creators were into at the time. Yeah, we, we broke a lot of rules with Danger Mouse. I think when we, when we set out to make Danger Mouse, the films that were around at the time, they weren't anarchistic like Danger Mouse is. The whole idea of the things that he does is anarchic. Um, the fact that if he runs too fast to the left, he can come off the edge of the film and have to struggle to get back on again. It, it's, I suppose it's art school mentality. We had a lot of 
uh, young designers in those early years who like to break rules. Danger Mouse is the brainchild of Brian Cosgrove and Mark Hall. The two had met while students at the Manchester College of Arts and Design, and in the 1960s had gotten their start doing television graphic design for the ITV franchise Granada Television out of Northwest England. Mark Hall left in 1969 to found his own production company, Stop Frame Animations, and brought Cosgrove on board soon after. Working out of Cosgrove's father-in-law's garden shed, they produced their first television series production in 1971 with The Magic Ball. Look. The ball grew bigger. Sam tied a string round it and explained to the prince what to do. Very limited animation, obviously, but it got their foot in the door. This was followed by the TV movie Captain Noah and His Floating Zoo in 1972 and the 1975 stop-motion adaptation of Naughty. But the most important thing they did during this time was the opening animation for the 1972 children's puppet show, Rainbow. Rainbow. Up above the streets and houses, rainbow climbing high. Everyone can see it smiling over the sky. Paint the whole world with the rainbow. It's a very simple thing, but it got Cosgrove and Hall involved with Thames Television. You may remember them as the producers of The Tomorrow People and Roger Price's pre-you-can't-do-that-on-television comedy shows. Thames Television was looking to create their own animation studio, and when Stop Frame Animations found itself closing down in 1975, Thames was quick to pick up Cosgrove and Hall and have them develop this subsidiary, which became Cosgrove Hall Films in 1976. Cosgrove and Hall continued with children book-esque shows for a while, switching back and forth between drawn and stop-motion animation. 1976's Charlton and the Wheelies and Jamie and the Magic Torch, 1980's Cockleshell Bay, some TV movie adaptations of The Talking Parcel, Cinderella and the Pied Piper. All of it very well made children's fare, and all of it nothing like Danger Mouse. This, as far as I can tell, was Hall's leadership, but Cosgrove was chomping at the bit to make something different. Part of our success is that we argue like crazy, but always for the right things. Our roles overlap, which caused problems in the beginning. Brian was happiest creating brand new ideas that came from the end of his pen, like Danger Mouse and Count Ducula. I was much happier with the classics, like The Pied Piper and The Wind in the Willows. So, at the beginning of the 1980s, Cosgrove Hall began to work on something very different, a more contemporary, action-oriented show about a secret agent that's a mouse. The secret agent genre was, of course, pretty big in British media, especially in the 1960s. There's James Bond, of course, and the television adventures of The Avengers, Adam Adamant, and The Saint. But the more direct point of reference is 1960s Danger Man starring Patrick McGowan of The Prisoner fame. Outside of the name, the final version of Danger Mouse wasn't a direct parody of Danger Man, but that may have been more in the case in development, as Danger Mouse was originally pitched as a still funny, but more action-oriented adventure show. The original pitch wasn't quite working, though, but then they brought in folk singer and stand-up comic Mike Harding into the writing room. Harding, who would end up both composing the show's music and co-writing all of Series 1, suggested that they pivot towards a more absurd comedy show. Mark Hall phoned me to say that they were working on a TV series about a mouse super agent and had got bogged down. Mark and his partner, Brian Cosgrove, wondered whether I had any thoughts on the matter. When we sat around the table, it seemed to me to be fairly simple. The characters had got stuck in reality, and were doing James Bond-type things rooted in a solid real world. I argue that once you invented a mouse secret agent, that all of creation and a good chunk of not creation was his oyster. In other words, we could be as barmy as we wanted. I invented some more characters, such as the two crows, who I originally called Leatherhead and Dorking, and gave Cockney accents to, 
wrote a trial script about bagpipe rustling, and called the evil toad Greenback after a farmer I knew in the Yorkshire Dales that I didn't like much. I also rough scripted nine or so ideas, and Brian Truman took the baton and ran with it. The rest is animation history. The role of both Danger Mouse and the narrator were given to David Jason, who at the time was best known for playing Granville in the sitcom Open All Hours, but only a few weeks before Danger Mouse premiered, he started arguably his most iconic role as Del Boy in Only Fools and Horses. How much do you spend on hairdressing, mate? Eh? That's got to be six or seven quid these days, isn't it? Now, you work that out over a year and it comes to a national debt, right? But for just £1.50, you can invest in one of these super deluxe trimming combs. You fiend, you black-hearted, no-good, monstrous, evil, scheming, treacherous, megalomaniacal misfit. Way down under, in the middle of the Australian outback, Danger Mouse, the world's greatest secret agent, and his faithful assistant Penfold have, after countless struggles, located Baron Silas Greenback's intercontinental ballistic boomerang factory and put it out of business. Once and for all. Now you get some shut-eye, Penfold, and maybe the weather will be better in the morning. And of course, I'd be remiss not to mention Count Dracula, a secondary antagonist introduced in Series 2 a campy vampire duck who will do anything to get into show business. He too was played by David Jason. Hey, Fender Mouse! You've never heard me say a thing! Just wait till you see my backing group! Backing group? You're not going to... Okay, let's uh, Let's hit it, fellow! One, two, one, two, three, five! Thanks for the memory. De-dum, de-dum, de-dum. Penfold and Greenback's crow henchman Leatherhead was voiced by Terry Scott, who had been a regular on the Carry On film series. Did you have a good day? Not bad, no, no. no the chap came into the office with a pound of opium, and we smoked it, and we spent the afternoon in a harem. Ooh, it's getting dark. Hello, a pair of... No, two pairs, three, uh, four. Their eyes... Eyes looking at me! Ooh, crumbs! Ooh, crikey! Ah! Oh, oh, crikey, sir! Sir, I, I don't my, 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 want to make a fuss, but I, I don't think we are alone! Colonel K and Baron Greenback were both voiced by Edward Kelsey, who had small roles in pretty much everything, including Zed Cars, The Avengers, Casualty, and Doctor Who. What the ancestors discovered was that there are waves in light just as there are waves in water. But the great difference between water waves and light waves is their speed. Oh, Danger Mouse, is Penfold there? Well, as a matter of fact, sir, he seems to have gone missing. Yeah, then it's true. True, sir? Yes, dear. I've just received a ransom note from that arch-criminal Baron Greenback. <laughs> Joking to the last. And that was your last joke. <laughs> Before this night is out, Nero, my remote-controlled fiends will scare them to death. What is the most difficult part of doing the voices? <laughs> the most difficult part, I think, is, well, is the narration. Because uh, I play the narrator as well as Danger Mouse. It's the concentration. You have to do five of these in, in a day, five episodes we do in a day. And the time you get to the end of the day, after you've been playing the narrator all down there, your voice gets very tired. Having three people doing the vast majority of the voices would help keep costs down, and for the majority of the show's run, cost cutting was the name of the game. Despite being one of the biggest animation projects to come out of Britain at this time, the animation in Danger Mouse is cheap. Animation was cheap everywhere, of course. This is the era of Hanna-Barbera and Filmation, but the cost cutting measures were very visible here. Lots of reused animation. Sometimes full sequences are reused. Sometimes animation cells are put into different contexts. They go out of their way to hide mouths as often as possible during conversation scenes, showing us characters from behind or having them off screen or having their mouths covered by things like a car's dashboard. I um, don't know how to tell you this, Penfold. Yes, Chief. But we've gone off the edge of the universe. Character design also factors into this. Despite the show being made up of mostly rodent characters, 
Nobody has a tail because that'd just be another element to animate. Danger Mouse's all-white ensemble keeps color usage down. A number of stories take place in similar settings, convenient for reusing assets. There are similar episodes that take place in space, in a snowy tundra, in a haunted castle. And in almost every story, you can expect to find a scene where Danger Mouse and Penfold are in the dark, so they only have to animate three eyes on a black background. This is for a purpose, however, because Danger Mouse is saving all that time and money and effort for the larger set pieces, the more elaborate visuals and gags that require a bit more work. Danger Mouse would rather have cheap animation 90% of the time, and then have great animation 10% of the time. Better than having, you know, mediocre animation 100% of the time. And of course, as the show progressed and became popular, and started selling merchandise, including video games, the budgets got bigger and fewer shortcuts were needed. And it was popular. Oh boy, was it. In 1983, the show had been viewed by 21 million people, a record for children's programming. And soon it would be ready for the international markets. The United States wasn't the first country to get it. Australia, Brazil, Portugal, they all beat us to the punch. But when Nickelodeon finally picked it up, sparks started to fly. The show reviewed well with American critics, often comparing the program to American works, especially Rocky and Bullwinkle. Uh, take this review from professional television critic Mike Hughes. Nickelodeon is the kids' channel that runs for free on most cable systems. The newest shows include one very good cartoon. Danger Mouse is about a secret agent mouse fighting a villainous frog. It isn't drawn very well, but it's very funny. If you count just the words, not the pictures, this is the funniest cartoon since Bullwinkle. One bad cartoon. Belle and Sebastian is about a farm boy and his giant dog who are searching for the boy's mother. It has bad drawings and dull words. I'm getting sidetracked, but I must stress, this is an actual, still active, professional adult television critic using all the complex vocabulary of a five-year-old. I don't like it. The pictures are stupid. You're stupid. But yes, Danger Mouse reviewed well in America, and for the next couple of years, it would be the channel's highest rated animated show and second highest rated show overall, just behind You Can't Do That on Television. And Jerry Laybourne was quick to sing its praises as a unique, cable-only experience. Danger Mouse is quality cartoon programming. Its classic, offbeat characters and crazy adventures have wit and style. Danger Mouse is a secret agent whose stories are funny, well-developed, intelligent, and humane. With quality, humor, and respect for its audience, this is a series one can't find on a network television. Laybourne struck up a working relationship with Cosgrove Hall, the effects of which we'll explore in more detail in the Count Ducula episode. But Nickelodeon and Cosgrove Hall were tight. How tight? Enough for Cosgrove Hall to completely redo a character's audio just for Nickelodeon. The henchman character of Stiletto, voiced by show writer Brian Truman, originally had an Italian accent. Nickelodeon, who had already gotten a lot of hate mail for profiling Al Capone on Against the Odds, were uncomfortable with that and asked Cosgrove Hall if they could change it. So, in the Nickelodeon broadcast, the character has more of a Cockney accent. <laughs> How many is that, Stiletto? One a thousand and a seven frozen cod, and a one thousand and eleven a frozen fish fingers. Strange. I didn't know fish had fingers. <laughs> How many is that, Stiletto? One thousand and seven frozen cod, and one thousand and eleven frozen fish fingers. Strange. I didn't know fish had fingers. It may seem like a small change, but the character's in a lot of episodes, and redoing the audio would have taken a lot of time and work. Subsequent home video releases use the original audio, so if you want to hear the Cockney version of Stiletto, you have to find VHS recordings of the Nickelodeon broadcasts. Though I did find it interesting that Nickelodeon was worried about offending Italian Americans, but didn't seem to have much of a problem with all of this. Quick, Penfold. Call the elephants. Right, DM. Um, call them all. Good grief. What a time for it to wear off. What wear off? 
I'll tell you later. What makes you think there'll be a later? Donga, Bokubi, Puali, Puali, Yumbo, Bok, 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 Hey, I think, Barone, that what we need is the cavalry to rescue us. Oh, 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 cavalry. Oh, oh, oh. Me plenty scared. Here comes General Costan. Oh, 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 oh. Allow us to offer you a lift, Baron. Oh, look, Penfield. Tong rats. Oh, hey, Hong Kong Tong. This Tong a teletolier. Oh, why your hair? You answer, or we sort you out a glute and a plopper. Yep, some good old animated racism. Forty-year-old television, you know, you, you, you just gotta call it out when you see it. Nickelodeon ran Danger Mouse promotions in the states, including costume character meet and greets at local malls across the country in 1986. However, something happened. In 1987, Nickelodeon announced Danger Mouse was going off the air, with the final broadcast in January of 1988. The exact reason for this is not publicly documented, but that was also the year the series went on a production hiatus. Only two episodes were produced in 1987. In any case, Nickelodeon stops airing a show wouldn't be newsworthy, even for a show as popular as Danger Mouse, except for a few odd details. The first was that Nickelodeon gave the show a genuine send-off, promotional material to let viewers know that the show would no longer be on the channel. Commercials where the cast of other Nickelodeon shows said their goodbyes to Danger Mouse with Danger Mouse responding with new audio voiced by David Jason himself. The first kids that were... Bye, Danger Mouse. Goodbye, Ray TK. Bye, Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse. I'm really gonna miss you. Goodbye, Mark, and good luck to the new guy. <laughs> Goodbye, Lassie, old friend. Bye, Bye Danger Mouse. Mouse. By the way, where are you going? I don't know. There. Yeah. Goodbye, Danger Mouse, and good luck. Nickelodeon salutes you. Goodbye, Nickelodeon. I'll miss you. It's an unprecedented tribute that 99% of shows on television will never get, and clearly demonstrates how important the show was to Nickelodeon. Again, no official public statements, but I wonder if this was the result of some contract stipulation, that for as long as Cosgrove Hall wasn't making new episodes, Nickelodeon couldn't air the show. And that speculation is supported by the fact that when Cosgrove Hall started making episodes again in 1991, Danger Mouse suddenly reappeared on Nick. Hell of a year to re-emerge too. In 1984, Danger Mouse was one of two animated shows on the station. In 1991, not only was Nickelodeon jam-packed with imported animation, it was also the year of the three original Nicktoons. So Danger Mouse coming back was a bit, how do you do, fellow kids? Not that it still wasn't fun, just that Danger Mouse wasn't the coolest person in the room anymore. Cosgrove Hall would produce two more series of Danger Mouse, ending for good in 1992, while Nickelodeon continued to air reruns into October of 1994. So I guess if it was a contract thing, it didn't apply for this second go around. There's a lot to the Cosgrove Hall story that I'm saving for the Count Ducula episode, but here's what they did with Danger Mouse after 1992. In 1993, Thames Television lost their ITV license, resulting in a series of takeovers and mergers that would result in Cosgrove Hall Films ending up in the hands of ITV in 1997, while the rights of Danger Mouse specifically went to Fremantle Media. In 2000, Cosgrove Hall opened up a digital media division, and a CGI Danger Mouse film went into the planning stages, but ultimately never got past pre-production. In 2009, Cosgrove Hall Films was no longer found to be profitable, and ITV shut it down. But ITV didn't own Danger Mouse, Fremantle did, and in 2015, they rebooted the franchise for a new generation.
and based on the episodes I've watched, it's pretty good. It has a lot of the same kitchen sink humor of the original with updated sleek animation from Boulder Media, some new voice talents including Stephen Fry as Colonel K, and a couple of new characters, including some women. I spend all my time making the greatest gadgets any secret agent has ever had, and you mouse always break them! Nonsense. Name three times that's ever happened. Careful, Danger Mouse. That bat is actually a laser-guided bug detector. Not that kind of bug, Danger Mouse. Some sort of secret communications device disguised as a book, eh? That's just a book. That was a high-def surveillance camera fly. And after years of research and effort, my Hadron Collider is now ready to unlock the mysteries of the universe! It's the ideal reboot, keeping what worked in the original while updating it to modern standards. And it's still going, with Nickelodeon now leaning into their nostalgic appeal with the return of shows like Double Dare, All That, and Are You Afraid of the Dark, the new Danger Mouse wouldn't be a bad show to pick up. The original show itself is not hard to find. It's had a strong home video presence in both the UK and the US, first on VHS, then on DVD. You can get the entire series on Region 1 DVD through A&E, and there are a lot of episodes on YouTube, but also, as of this writing, all of Danger Mouse, both the original and the reboot, can be found streaming on American Netflix. It is one of the most well-preserved programs we've discussed on Knickknacks and the easiest to watch. But is Danger Mouse worth watching in 2019? There are certainly aspects of it that haven't aged well. Humor, in a general sense, ages quicker and usually ages worse than most other genres, but even if you put yourself in an early 80s mindset, those moments of racist caricature can put a major hamper on the whole thing. On the flip side, there are jokes here that still work, and as proven by the reboot, the premise itself is solid and really fun. And if you're here for a media history perspective, Danger Mouse was a pretty big deal. You can certainly see bits of Danger Mouse in other programs. I wouldn't be surprised if Inspector Gadget took some cues from it. The raspy voiced villain with his lap pet, the transforming car, the grumbling mustachioed chief handing out missions. The narrator character is like the great grandfather of the narrator character from the Powerpuff Girls. But you know, Kids in the late 80s and early 90s weren't watching from a media history perspective. I watched Danger Mouse as a kid, and enjoyed it, but it was never a favorite of mine. Maybe I was too American, maybe I was too young, but I'd rather have been watching Doug or Heathcliff or Looney Tunes than Danger Mouse. It's something I definitely appreciate more from an adult perspective, but from an adult perspective, the flaws stand out all the more. Still, as far as Nickelodeon's history go, it was their first animated program, one of their highest rated programs, opened up a relationship between them and an animation studio. Essentially, Danger Mouse opened the floodgates for animation on Nickelodeon, which would ultimately save the channel. You Can't Do That on Television kept Nickelodeon afloat, but it was Danger Mouse that taught them to swim. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon! Nick, 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 Nickelodeon! Next time, with those shorter edited episodes of Danger Mouse leaving some open air time, Nickelodeon finds another bit of British animation to fill in the gaps. Hey, maybe there's less racist caricatures in this one. Boy, that sounds like a setup for disappointment. Today's research plug goes to the Internet Archive. I don't really have a central source this time around. Somebody should really write a book on Cosgrove Hall films. So the research in this episode was primarily news articles and television interviews, of which you can find many on archive.org. Not to mention the Wayback Machine. There's a few now-dead Danger Mouse fan sites that were worth taking a look at. If you're doing research on anything, be sure to give this site a pass-through at least once. You might be surprised what you can find. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to support Knickknacks, perhaps consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research, production values, and Dr. Pepper. Lots and lots of Dr. Pepper. You can also support Knickknacks by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, sending a smaller one-time donation through Ko-fi, following me on Twitter, and sharing Knickknacks with all your friends. That's it for Nickelodeon 1984. So let's all get excited for 1985, 
We've got shows like Turkey Television and Star Trek the Animated Series to look forward to. Yay!